So a couple of days ago, Jacob from XP to level 3 put out a video entitled Saving Throws Are Dumb, and as you can probably tell from the title of this video, I don't really agree with that. But before I continue, I will say that in general, I actually do really, really like Jacob's channel. I find XP to level 3 has a lot of really interesting and entertaining content, and I do think that he, uh, he does provide a lot of interesting insights into the game, and despite the fact that I don't really agree with his assertion that saving throws are dumb, I do think that this actually does bring up a pretty interesting discussion about the topic. So same thing as usual, if you guys have not already, please do consider subscribing to the channel. It does sincerely help me a lot. It lets me know the types of videos you guys are interested in seeing. But without too much further ado, let's just move on into it. So there are a couple of things that Jacob brings up throughout the video that I do think deserve kind of calling out specifically and getting a little bit of attention drawn towards them because I do think they kind of to some capacity misrepresent what saving throws are really all about. Now obviously that all being said, Dungeons & Dragons is a game that's kind of built around the entire idea of, of customization, being able to do whatever you want, what works best for you and what works best for your group at your table. So I don't want to take that away from, from him or from anyone else who thinks that saving throws are dumb or if there's some way they could be dramatically improved. I don't think they're perfect. I think there are a lot of ways that they can be improved. Something that he mentions as well is that primarily dexterity and wisdom are 90% of the time those are the saves you're going to make. I wish that there were a lot more incorporations of other types of saving throws. There, you know, Recently we are seeing intelligence coming up a little bit. There are a few that have some charisma saves but strength again is pretty pretty lacking in general. So right at the top of the video, he does kind of discuss the idea of saving throws being akin to something like a reflex. And yes, there are some other tabletop RPG systems uh, that do use the idea of a reflex score or reflex saving throws as well. But I think that the idea of a saving throw is not really comparable to that. He uses the example of if you, you, know, you touch a stove, a hot stove, and kind of pulling, pulling your hand off immediately you would have to kind of make a dexterity saving throw to see if you, you know, suffer the full effects of the damage from that. And I don't really think that's true. I don't think that's even accurate for how you would kind of rule that. At my table, if one of my players put their hand on some kind of a hot stove, I would probably just tell them to take the full brunt of the damage. Saving throws, in my opinion, are much more closely related to an idea of an instinct rather than a reflex. And there is some kind of a nuanced difference between the two because one you sort of do mindlessly and one is sort of based on your sort of innate need to preserve your life, which I think is pretty much universally true for most humans. In the case of touching the hot stove, that's something that would probably be more related to have having made a, either an intelligence or a wisdom check to kind of hover your hand over it before you actually touch it. And in the event that they do touch it, honestly, yeah, like I said before, if they realize that it's hot and they still decide to do it, I'm just going to make them take the full whatever D4, D6, D10 damage, whatever, whatever it might be. A little bit later on in the video, he does kind of go on to say that he thinks that saving throws create a really lame narrative and completely undermine player actions and agency. And honestly, I really completely disagree with this for a, for a point that I will fully address a little bit later in the video as well. He uses a pretty interesting example, and that being if a dragon is smart enough to kind of trick their, their, their foe and their prey and corner them into some kind of a, a room or a small cavern, and then unleash their fire, uh, their, their, their breath weapon onto them, the idea that they're just going to be like, oh, I'm going to make a save and not take any damage is a little bit ludicrous. And, and, and yeah, to some extent, I can kind of understand that. But to a much larger extent, if I've been cornered into, uh, into, into a room and now a dragon is about to un unleash some kind of, of, of fiery breath onto me, I can see that coming. And I'm probably going to try and get out of the way. And that is sort of what the crux of the whole saving throw uh, mechanic is. And honestly, I think this just makes a lot of logical sense. It's, it's even something that I have discussed a little bit on this channel before. While, yes, D&D is a game that's largely about the, the suspension of belief, that's not to say that you can't incorporate some degree and some elements of reality into the game. If you see a boulder or fire that's like hurling at you, you're going to try and get out of the way. You're going to try and mitigate that impact as much as you possibly can. So yeah, maybe the fire still hits you, but maybe it kind of grazes your leg a little bit. Think about breath attacks and the way that they're described. For the most part, they are in five foot lines or in cones. There's a lot of space that you can get around that logically, while you might not be able to get completely out of the way and take no damage with the exception of evasion. But this just makes logical sense. 
And even in the case of a rogue with evasion, that is what they do. That is their specialty. They are experts in being able to be incredibly lithe and quick and get out of the way as quickly as they need to. That just, again, it just sort of underwrites the entire uh, premise of the class and the abilities that they've taken as a result. Probably the biggest thing that I took issue with in the entire video is the next thing that he says, where he states that saving throw, whenever he has to make a saving throw, he feels like a little baby having his hand held. And honestly, I think this is just completely ridiculous and completely misrepresents the entire idea of what a saving throw really is. Again, it really goes back to that difference between being an instinct versus a reflex. I would assert that, you know, saving throw is not you being given one more chance to get away from the, the, the intellect of hour that's about to, to consume your, your brain, but it's rather that you're not having your instincts removed from the equation entirely. They're very, very similar ideas, and there's a little bit of a nuance between the two, and I think that's a really important distinction to remember. The next point he makes is something I largely agree with, but disagree with how it kind of ties into this topic. He says that he's really not a fan of wishy-washy games with invincible player characters and games that have no real sense of urgency. And honestly, I completely agree with that entirely. The irony is that I think that's actually more a product of something that he states a little bit later is something he's in favor of, which is more of the sort of ability score improvements and feats, which he thinks are a great contribution to the game. And that's how you can kind of get around some of these other things. I really do think those uh, ability score improvements, and in particular, there's a lot of feats which can really lead to the sort of wishy-washy game with invincible player characters that kind of lose a lot of sense of urgency. I really do think it is like that, that sense of urgency is really what makes D&D an exciting game. And I don't think that removing saving throws kind of affects that. And I don't think that the incorporation of saving throws affects it either. A little bit later towards the end of the video, he finally suggests something that he thinks kind of could potentially function as an alternative to saving throws in a lot of cases. He mentions uh, the idea of certain spells being able to kind of telegraph their uh, kind of impact. Specifically, he talks about fireball. So if the wizard stands back and casts a fireball, they'd be able to see this sort of area that's sort of engulfed in runes on the ground. And everyone will kind of know that this is where the fireball is going to head. So now they have to make a decision about whether they stay there, whether they help someone out, whether they, they run away, whether they just stand and attack because they're in an advantageous position. He talks a lot, a lot about this being a sort of an interesting and integral decision point and makes the game really more exciting and more interesting because it has a lot of more high stakes decisions. And I don't think that that's the case. And there's a couple of reasons why I don't really think that's the case. Firstly, it actually runs directly counter to a point that he made earlier on in the video where you don't really narrate your characters getting tired and kind of you know, slowing down over the, th over the course of battle because that would get slow, that would kind of bog things down. And I think if you had, if you had a wizard who's standing back and he's casting a fireball and it's telegraphing in the area, and now he's just, and, but that's kind of his entire turn. Nothing, he didn't do anything else. There was no immediate impact to his, to his spell, to his action. Now he's just kind of standing there chilling, just kind of waiting for something to happen and ultimately for his fireball to probably not really have that much of an impact because at the end of the day, it's either going to do one of two things. Either no one's going to move and they're just going to take the full effect of the damage or everyone's going to move and it doesn't do anything. And in that kind of case, that really strips that wizard player of feeling useful at all. It makes him feel completely useless. Now, maybe outside of some niche circumstances where you're desperately trying to control some space, but there's better spells for that. The idea of casting a fireball to simply control space is kind of far-fetched. So yeah, sure, maybe, maybe it triggers a few attacks of opportunity because uh, the enemy decides to flee or you decide to run away or you decide to scoop up uh, you know, a, a vulnerable villager who is kind of maybe right in the path of, of, the, uh, of the fireball. Sure, maybe there is some kind of like uh, a micro level of decision making there, but overall, it's not that interesting. It's either everyone gets hit with the full effect of the fireball and they all die or no one gets hit with the full effect of the fireball and the wizard feels like they did nothing. He goes on a little bit to talk about uh, how there is a certain kind of school, entire school of spells, the illusion school, which is really, really heavily underutilized simply because of the effect of the inclusion of saving throws. Because 
Um, be because of how likely people are to succeed on these saving throws, most people don't even bother utilizing these spells. He then goes on to suggest a little bit of a, of a variation or alteration to the rule that kind of eliminates the entire need for saving throws with these illusion type spells. You know, he says that instead the saving throw should be a, a comparison of your spell DC versus their either like wisdom score or their intelligence score. So in, in this kind of a case, uh, a, a character or an enemy could potentially always fail or potentially always succeed. And he thinks this is a, a great uh, alternative because, you know, it kind of rewards building your character in a certain way or, you know, he thinks it's kind of insane that the all-powerful almighty wizard might just roll really badly and then fail on some kind of a crappy mind control spell. For me, personally, I don't think that's any more interesting. I think that's actually a lot less fun. I think it's actually a lot more interesting that maybe the, the less intelligence fighter can really have a brilliant moment of clarity where he comes up with something or or that sort of um, slower, weaker, elderly mage can have a, move, uh, a moment where he, he sees something just coming at the right time and he's able to move his arms out of the way and not suffer the effects of it. So I kind of love the idea that sometimes rolling well can just help and obviously given modifiers and how they work, more often than not, it's you're not going to have a great time with it, but sometimes you do. And I think those kind of magic moments are really, really defining in D&D. I think it makes it a lot more fun. But even still, his idea is actually not even that novel because it actually exists already in the Dungeon Master's Guide on page 239 under the variant rule automatic success. Now, admittedly, they do say in the rules that this should not work against saving throws, probably for the same reasons that I kind of mentioned here as well. But if you really wanted to, just do it. The idea here being that uh, with the automatic success variant rule, the, you know, if your score minus five is equal to or higher than the DC, you just always pass any checks. Now, wizards themselves in a paragraph in this description do say that the biggest problem with this idea is that it creates incredible predictability, which can be very stale. The second your players realize that all of their characters will have a certain uh, a certain skill set where they will never fail a check and they will always succeed on something else. Those are the only characters that are ever going to be put up to the task of doing these things. And that's just boring. That's just kind of not fun. I love the idea that the person that comes up with the idea or the, some, the, the, the cleric that steps on the trap happens to be the one that has to interact with those kinds of things. So removing this, I guess, randomness, which they do say also can be a problem if you don't like that wild unpredictability of it. This kind of randomness to me makes things a lot more exciting, a lot more interesting as part of what I actually prefer it, you know, and trying to, to alleviate this issue of these constant automatic successes and only specific members of the party only doing certain things, you can kind of combat that by just increasing the DC on the check so they're not automatically failing, not automatically succeeding on everything, but that just kind of exacerbates the exact same problem you were trying to get around by implementing this rule in the first place. And throughout the course of the video, he talks about rogues and saving throws and their kind of interaction being really, really uninteresting because they just take no damage because of evasion. But if that's something that really bothers you, then once again, the Dungeon Master's Guide has your back because on page 242, under the degrees of failure or success at a cost variant rule, again, these can have kind of dramatic impacts on these the, the, the scaling levels of success or failure of your saving throw if someone were to succeed or fail on a certain you know, uh, a no numerical threshold. If they fail or succeed by one or five or 10, you can have different levels of impacts for each of these things. The entire kind of thread of this video really boils saving throws down to kind of removing choice and uh, undermining player action and, and urgency and things like that. And Honestly, I don't see it that way at all. The way I see it is that saving throws, whether you're succeeding or failing, are kind of the, the culmination of so many different decisions that you've made. The, the class you chose, the race, your background, your subclass, where you allocated those stats, how you kind of engaged with an enemy or, or some kind of a hostile uh, creature before combat, or levels of deception or intimidation. There's so many things that kind of go into it that... To say that it removes choice is completely disingenuous because it's really the, the, the result of so many choices that you've made that, are, that kind of go into deciding the role or the result of your saving throw. All right, guys, so that's it. That is, those are my thoughts on saving throws. Let me know in the comments what do you think down below. And again, please do remember to like and subscribe. It does sincerely help. But otherwise, until the next one, take care.